If LDO causes direct injury to the endothelium, then why can I show you cases of atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? If this is truly the dose makes the poison, then why can I show you cases of atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? And conversely, why can I show you cases of elevated LDL without atherosclerosis? So consider this first. This is Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy, premature atherosclerosis associated with monogenic insulin resistance. There is one gene mutated in these people, rare LMNA mutations that underlie the familial partial lipodystrophy result in insulin resistance. And hyperinsulinemia is associated with early coronary heart disease. These people have elevated free fatty acids, okay? They have elevated free fatty acids, which means this is elevated right here, which leads to insulin resistance. That is because they have a mutation in this gene. So they have insulin resistance, but they do not have elevated LDL cholesterol. In fact, sometimes they have low. This is the same uh, condition, elevated C-reactive protein and free fatty acids among non-diabetic carriers of a missense mutation in the gene encoding laminin A to C, LMNA with partial lipodystrophy. Dunnigan type partial lipodystrophy, LMNA mutations in non-diabetic patients with familial partial lipodystrophy associated with several metabolic and biochemical changes, particularly in women. This contributes to an increased susceptibility to coronary heart disease. So this is a condition in which people have one gene mutated. That single gene, LMNA mutation, causes insulin resistance and they get atherosclerosis, but their LDL is not elevated. So if dose makes the poison, why is LDL not causing a problem here? Or how can these people get atherosclerosis without elevated LDL? Similarly, consider glycogen storage disease 1A. These patients have hyperlipidemia, but this hyperlipidemia does not impair vascular endothelial function in glycogen storage disease type 1A. So if LDL, low density lipoprotein, this particle, if that is directly injurious, to the endothelium, then why do we not see a problem in these patients? If LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, why do we not see a problem when they have hyperlipidemia in GSD1A? So now we have another paper, the same thing, an association among iron, copper, and zinc, selenium, antioxidant status, and dyslipidemic pediatric patients, GSD types 1A and 3, they do not develop atherosclerosis right? The trace elements and antioxidant enzyme levels in GSD patients failed to explain the atherosclerotic escape phenomenon reported in these patients. <laughs> it's not freaking rocket science, guys. If they're not insulin resistant, they're not going to develop atherosclerosis. Is glycogen storage disease 1A associated with atherosclerosis? No, it's not. But the medical community can't possibly wrap its head around this. And it drives lipidologists freaking bonkers because they have elevated lipids, but they don't have atherosclerosis because they don't have insulin resistance. So how can LDL be directly related to endothelial dysfunction and endothelial injury if I can show you both of those cases? Now, familial hyperlipidemia often gets brought up, but there are also cases of people with familial hyperlipidemia, FH, who do not develop atherosclerosis late in life such as this one, 72-year-old patient, long-standing, untreated, familial hypercholesterolemia, no coronary artery calcification, a case report. Says it all, if LDL is directly injurious to the endothelium, why didn't it happen in that lady? Well, probably because she wasn't insulin resistant. And that is the proximate event necessary for the formation of atherosclerosis. So why do some patients with Familial hypercholesterolemia develop aggressive atherosclerosis. Well, unfortunately, some people with familial hypercholesterolemia have upregulation of LDL receptor-related proteins in their macrophages as well. So these genetic changes that result in familial hypercholesterolemia do not often only affect LDL levels. They often affect the immune cells, the macrophages, which take up the LDL and form these plaques in the cell wall. So if the mutations with FH are affecting the immune cells that are directly causing or creating atherosclerosis, 
then we have an imperfect system. There are many variables being modified there. FH is a very poor, not a good model system for hypercholesterolemia because of these mutations and their many effects on lipid metabolism. If you are interested in further evidence that ApoB does not directly injure the endothelium, consider chimpanzees, our not so distant relatives. Chimpanzees have an apolipoprotein, which is essentially apolipoprotein B, which is essentially identical to humans. Chimpanzee serum lipoproteins, isolation, characterization, comparative aspects of the low density lipoprotein and apolipoprotein BH, it's essentially similar to humans. But heart disease is common in humans and chimpanzees, but it's caused by different pathological processes. Chimpanzees do not develop atherosclerosis despite having levels of LDL that are much higher than humans. They're around 270 milligrams per deciliter. And remember, their ApoB100 molecule looks just like humans. So why don't chimpanzees get heart attacks from atherosclerosis? They get heart attacks from a uh, arrhythmia triggered by myocardial fibrosis, which is again why I had to qualify my statement earlier about atheroma-related heart attacks versus arrhythmia-related heart attacks. But chimpanzees do not develop atheromas. They do not develop the thing that humans get from elevated cholesterol. So if LDL, which is essentially the same molecule in humans as it is in chimpanzees, if LDL is directly injuring the endothelium, why isn't it injuring the endothelium of chimpanzees? They don't get heart disease in the same way that humans do, and they have even more LDL than us. In fact, they have even more LDL than I do the last time I checked.